Mr. Fulp is a certified professional geologist with advanced degrees in earth sciences and geology. Uh, and he has over 35 years of experience as an exploration, exploration geologist working and living in North and South America, Europe, and Asia. In addition to his work as an analyst and as a newsletter writer, Mr. Fulp has written and spoken extensively on freedom, libertarianism, individual rights, science and reason, and pacifism. He operates a small farm in New Mexico. Mr. Fulp will be speaking on the fallacy of belief, or yes, Virginia, there is no Santa Claus. Mr. Fulp. Give me a second here to get organized. So I thank uh, Jay and Rajni for the opportunity to speak today. Um, Jay immediately talked about the concept of reason and today I'm going to talk about science and reason versus faith and belief. I also took something from Jay right now. Uh, you mentioned Doug Casey's new book uh, or a book coming uh, and I have to say, you compared that to The Fountainhead, and in my opinion, The Fountainhead is Ayn Rand's greatest book, much more so than Atmos Shrub. Um, I'm also going to take something from Dr. Farrell today, and this is, is, is his advice. Uh, for a man to be heard, he should relate his experiences as a boy, and I'm going to do that. The fallacy of belief for Yes, Virginia, there is no Santa Claus. For as long as I can remember, and I have a very good memory, it started with Santa Claus, and it will never end until the day I die. Someone, somewhere, somehow, in some position of authority is telling me to believe in this, that, or the other. I hate the word belief. When someone says, I believe, I cringe, or I'm a believer in, or it is my belief. To that I say, yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. My favorite American author, Mark Twain, also hated the concept. He once infamously said, I'm, excuse me, faith is believing what you know ain't so. Personally, I refuse to use the verb and noun in their various forms. They are never parts of my vocabulary. To the faith and belief mongers, I pose this question. What in American culture demands that our parents, our teachers, our politicians who become our elected leaders constantly and continuously invent mythical creatures and promulgate outright lies to us, those who they obviously view as their serfs, uh, underlings, subordinates, and minions. At one time or another in our lives, the authority figures have tried to make us believe in the following. Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, the Tooth Fairy, a monotheistic God, the Russians are coming. We are winning the war that Obama is waging to make peace. Gold is going to $4,000 in the near future. And the boogeyman is going to get us if we don't get him first. So that's six beliefs, and I will go through each of those individually. Belief number one, yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. My personal rebellion against belief and authority started at age six when I was eavesdropping from the hallway uh, into the living room and I overheard my mother tell her friend about hiding the candy that the Easter Bunny had brought for my brother and me. Well, I'd already figured out by that time that the Tooth Fairy, who exchanged a tooth under your pillow for a shiny mercury dime, was bogus. But I didn't dare tell my mother that, because then I wouldn't get any more silver dimes. Now I own about 20,000 of them and two bags of junk silver. That said, I didn't really give a rat's ass for a stuffed rabbit, uh, little bright yellow baby chicks, uh, hard-boiled eggs colored red with number 40 dye, 
or those little egg and bunny shaped candies they gave you at Easter of really, really bad chocolate. But it did get me thinking, if the Tooth Fairy and the Easter Bunny were fakes made up my parents, then where did Santa Claus fit into this? Into this world of non-make-believe. Now all of a sudden, we were talking about some real serious stuff. For Christ's sakes, this was the jolly old Saint Nick who zipped around the world on Christmas Eve uh, in an airborne sled carried by flying reindeer, climbed down our six inch wide chimney, uh, complete with gas log and, uh, and, and, and uh, a fake log in a gas, gas fireplace, and ate the hot cookies and cold milk that my brother and I left for him. That a good old bewhiskered guy brought us pearl-handled cap guns and rubber-tipped uh, uh, arrows, bows and arrows, and three-inch tall green little plastic army man, complete with one with a big bazooka and bright red shiny Schwinn bicycles. Unholy moly! Was Santa Claus my parents too? If I couldn't believe in Santa Claus anymore, then what could I believe in? Was my bounty of toys on Christmas morning going to just up and disappear? Never one to beat around the bush, I asked directly into my parents' credit. They gave me a direct answer. The Santa who rode a mile down Broadway in a red fire engine at the annual Christmas parade was really just the big fat Buick dealer who lived in a ritzy neighborhood on the other side of town. My brother, who was five at the time, a year younger, cried for an entire afternoon after I told him the truth. <laughs> Belief number two, there is an invisible man who lives in the sky. Now the whole religious thing took a lot longer for me to ferret out. I, when I, I was raised a Southern Baptist uh, evangelical Christian, so from about age 11, eight to 11, I could even con Jesus into forgiving me for being a hyperactive little boy. Yes, I have ADD. I think that's uh, to my benefit. Uh, who got all A's in school, but got bad marks or does not work well with others, talks back to his teacher, does not respect authority, daydreams in class. That was me. But here's how it worked. I got forgiven for all these sins and shortcomings by getting myself saved or born again or some such silly nonsense in my opinion. It required getting my head dunked under water so I could become a ritualistic cannibal and eat some dry as a bone flat crackers washed down with Welch's grape juice because we were Baptists and drinking wine is a really, really bad sin. And this was all blessed by the local fire and brimstone preacher man to become the fresh, flesh and blood of Jesus Christo. Okay, but by age 12, when they told me that Jonah got swallowed up by a whale and spit out on a white sand beach, no the worse for wear, I thought, that's friggin' ridiculous. That's just another lie they expect me to buy. Now, I didn't dare say that out loud because my Sunday school teacher, some old biddy named Mrs. Jones, would tell my mom that I was going to burn in hell, and that would have been hell to pay with my mom. But she could only do that. I would only go to hell after I was already dead. I thought, whatever. So because of some funky dude named Joan, a really big fish who isn't really a fish, and yet another teacher I despise, I was soon shedding my religion, much like uh, Michael Stipe. From that day on, I considered it a monumental and uh, waste of my valuable time to spend two hours of a precious two-day break in, uh, from school in this nonsensical endeavor. Unfortunately, the parental units didn't quite see it that way, so I was forced to go to church. By age 16, my Sunday mornings at church were spent in the, in the balcony, nodding off with yet another hangover. <clears throat> my only saving grace was the little cute hotties in their short, short miniskirts 
who set up there too. After all, it was 1969, uh, and that helped relieve the pain and boredom. Now, if you're one of the believers, I apologize, uh, because I know how important religion is to some folks. And so just please forgive my sin for not buying in. There are many Americans who believe that their nightly prayers will be answered by the invisible man who lives in the sky. And that's perfectly fine with me. But as a scientist, I cannot fathom blind faith and unquestioning belief in anything I cannot see, hear, touch, taste, smell, or touch. When it comes to religion, I say each to his own. Live and let live. With all due respect to Robert Ripley, believe it or not. Belief number three, the Russians are coming. The Russians are coming. Another part of my misguided beliefs of my childhood in the late 50s and 60s was, of course, the Russians are coming. American Cold War leaders, starting with Nixon, followed by McCarthy, and succeeded by Kennedy, claimed that the soulless, godless bastards from the unwashed East were infiltrating, infiltrating our lives with Soviet spies. I was in kindergarten in 1958 as my family reacted with fear and trepidation when two Sputniks are over are orbiting over our heads in the Ozarks of Missouri. Meanwhile, three of America's first four attempts to put a satellite in space failed. And Khrushchev compounded our worries at the time when he infamously said to a group of NATO ambassadors, we will bury you. He followed that up in 1960 at the United Nations angrily pounding his shoe on the table when someone gave an anti-Soviet speech. For sure, that bald-headed old fart scared the bejesus out of middle America. And President Kennedy didn't help matters when he posted a letter in Life magazine in 1961 promoting the building of bomb shelters. So where did that get us? while well, America's irrational fear of a game of dominoes led to a 14-year quagmire in the jungles of Southeast Asia. It was become the first war that the USA lost since the War of 1812. Our military elected and appointed leaders kept encouraging us to believe we are winning the war, but Cronkite's nightly news told otherwise. All we were doing was killing and maiming peasants and orphaning children of those on the wrong side of an unwinnable civil war. That and shipping our boys home with broken bodies, shell-shocked souls, say that about five times <laughs> rapidly, drug-addled minds, and 58,220 in body bags. Belief number four, comes right in, war is peace. One would think that our current New Age left president would have studied, understood, and realized the mistakes of the past in the future jungle and would not continue to repeat them 40 years later in the hot, stinking deserts of Afghanistan and Iraq and Libya and Syria, one would think. But like Kennedy and Johnson, Nixon, Reagan, Big Bush, Clinton, Little Bush, before him, Barack Hussein, Obama the second kept the faith. What faith? The faith that is in the military industrial complex that a lifelong military man, President Dwight D. Eisenhower, warned us about in 1960. So what has Obama done to keep the faith? Just started another war or two. Should we be surprised by that? After all, this president, the 44th president of the United States, was in Oslo, Norway, in December 10, 2009, to accept the Nobel Peace Prize. In a 36-minute speech of classical 1984 news speak, this man said war 28 times. 
He said the word peace 14 times. Channeling Orwell's first slogan of the party displayed, if you remember, on the white facade of the Ministry of Truth. Obama has asked us to believe war is peace. Belief number five, gold is going to $4,000. 37 years ago, in September 1969, pardon me, I bought my first gold. The price had been going up steadily that year and reached an all-time high of 330 an ounce. Nevertheless, I decided it was time to own gold. So uh, one day after a long day in the field, uh, I walked into a rock shop in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I bought 11 gold quartz specimens for 10 bucks a piece. It was a pretty good deal because the rocks were quite hot and the owner wanted to move them quickly. And it, it turns out they've been smuggled out of the, out of the 16 to 1 stope of the Sunnyside mine. And, uh, and he really wanted to move them quickly. Four months later, the price of gold had hit $850 an ounce. And for a very brief period of time, the gold bugs ruled the financial world. Of course, the price collapsed nearly as fast as it had risen. We all know that any financial market that goes exponential is, uh, is going to go parabolic. The gold market from late 79 to early 1980 was just a speculative bubble, just like tulips and South Sea globalization. However, the collapse of gold did nothing to, conter to curb the ir irrational exuberance of the gold bugs. We were asked to believe that gold was going to $1,000 an ounce soon. In December 82, a popular newsletter team predicted $4,000 gold by 1985. Now those, pe those two ladies are a good friend of mine and, the, and I subscribed to their newsletter, but they got that wrong. Imagine if you would have followed their advice 33 years ago when gold traded at $445. Those soothsayers advised putting up to 50% of your net assets into gold bullion. You would have been better off opening a savings account at the time in your local hometown bank. For after all, back then, a CD, a one-year CD, actually paid interest, 12%. Now they charge you fees for the privilege of keeping your devaluing fiat dollars in their, on their books. From a high of 850 in January of 1980, gold took 27 years to get back to that price. It took 28 years to hit $1,000. And it hit 20, took 29 years to stick at the aforementioned four figures. Gold touched $1,900 an ounce on September 11th. By December uh, 2015, it lost 45% of that price. Remember what I said about parabolas. Gold is not a long-term financial investment. It only serves as an insurance policy, a safe haven, and a hedge against financial calamity. That said, and like many in this room, I continue to, to uh, purchase gold and I can, uh, accumulate 10 to 20 percent of my net worth of physical bullion in my physical possession. Have you ever considered the yahoos that are saying that gold's going to $10,000 just might be talking their own books? It's, if gold goes to 5000 or 10000 in the immediate future, you better also own some guns and some gas and some goods and keep a bug out bag by the door and have a survival plan. Be careful what you wish for. Police number six, beware the boogeyman. Our elected politicians, leaders, military, and such are determined to make us minions believe in a boogeyman that we can fear, hate, and despise. This phenomenon arguably started with the aforementioned Khrushchev, who was succeeded by the next man in line at the Kremlin. In the 60s and 70s, we had his commie comrades Ho Chi Minh and Chairman Mao to hate. By the early 80s, it was the 
Ayatollah Khomeini playing the lead part. When this evil red empire collapsed in 1991, our attention was turned to the Middle East. Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden, uh, and his underlings at Al-Qaeda, the Taliban. Now it's a leaderless organization that our own military armed and our foreign policy created, called ISIS, or ISIL if you're Secretary of State Char John Kerry, or Daesh if you're President Obama. The fear mongers continue to weave tales, fairy tales that is, that give our warriors, and we will always have warriors, excuse for waging a never ending war on terror that allows an increasingly socio-fascist government to gradually and covertly erode, erode our constitutionally guaranteed rights of uh, freedom of speech at all under the guise of international and domestic security. Because of this irrational belief, we Americans are permanently subjected to a terror alert of orange, whatever the hell that means. Every time we try to board an airplane, we must shed our shoes and walk in bare stocking feet on cold, dirty floors, have our personal toiletries inspected, choose between having our bodies scanned by millimeter wave machines, our personal privates groped, uh, and buy three, this is what really gets me, buy three dollar bottles of water from airport vendors instead of bringing a container of tap water from home that costs less than a penny. Our lives are monitored by video cameras except inside the privacy of our own homes. Well, that is, if you fa unless you fail to put a piece of duct tape over your laptop camera, or you're unconcerned enough to hook up a smart TV. Our passports and our driver's license are embedded with microchips that allow the government to track, our, uh, track us wherever we, we go. Hitler branded Jews. Today, some people get their pets microchipped. How long before our police state insists on embedding chips in our children, all in the name of safety and security? Did you know that the NBC Nightly News is actually promoting chips in children as inevitable sooner or later, and that our military is testing at this time? An American patriot Ed Snowden blew the whistle on all this crap three years ago. Now the brave Mr. Snowden now lives in exile at the pleasure of another oppressive dictator in an even more fascist regime. Folks, face the facts. Believing the lies of Big Brother permits us to be watched and tracked 24-7, 32 years after the prescient Orwell predicted. In conclusion, as an educated scientist, I'm a natural skeptic. Present me with solid and concrete evidence if you want an idea seriously considered. Belief, faith, dogma, creed, doctrine, and conviction are anathema to theory, hypothesis, evidence, fact, and proof. All of us have been lied to since we were we children cajoled, wheedled, coerced, intimidated, threatened, and forced into believing for much longer than memory serves, in fact, from cradle to grave. That said, it becomes a matter of personal choice. I choose to be a free-thinking individual, not easily con, connived, or convinced. All comes from, I'm from Missouri, and you gotta show me the beef. That said, I will never believe in what they tell me to believe. I reject belief. Belief is fallacy. All this said, I remain a live and let live guy. My life philosophy is do not tread on me and I will not tread on you. In the name of science and reason, amen.